this morning when Eric and Caroline and Alex were confirmed, I said that one of the reasons we really need to lay our hands on their heads and pray for them is because it's quite possible, probable maybe, that we all, not just them, that we all can get distracted by other things and look for joy and freedom and purpose outside of the good news of the proclamation of the gospel. After all, how many people, just since I've been here, how many people in your own lives can you think of who, like those three young people today, have knelt and confirmed their faith and yet now only have sort of a nostalgic view of the church? If even that. One of the reasons that I chose that reading from 2 Thessalonians, although it's not usually read on Reformation Sunday, is that I think it gives for us sort of a, a, a almost like a mission statement, sort of a, an outline for what we want for the church and for our lives. I had them look at it at the first service. I don't know if you have it on. If you happen to get a blue sheet, you can look at it again. He's talking to the, the, the Thessalonians, people in Thessalonia, who are being persecuted because of their faith. And he's saying to them that in the midst of those challenges, he thanks God because in spite of that, they are growing abundantly in faith and in their love for one another. Well, we might think of it for us as the challenges we face in a secular world. And that our goal, our true north, we might say, is to, in spite of that, as a church, as individuals, to grow abundantly in faith and in our love for one another. And to that end, Paul says he's praying for them. And so he says, I'm praying that God will make you worthy of his call and will fulfill by his power every good resolve and work of faith so that because of you, our Lord Jesus may be glorified. Well, that's what we pray for the young people who were confirmed today and for all of us, that those things would be our true north and that the good news of God's love in Jesus would be the source of our fulfillment and our freedom. And we pray that especially for those places like that part of Germany that was at one time East Germany, although I guess it's true in all of Europe. We pray especially for those places where the gospel is threatened by apathy, and by materialism. And I guess maybe that includes our own church community and the churches in the United States. So let me close by telling you something that has a <coughs> word of hope in it. We started out that day in Light Eisleben at St. Peter's St. Paul Lutheran Church, which is the church in which Martin Luther was baptized. I don't know if it was called that then, but now it's called St. Peter's St. Paul. So we're sitting there. Now, this is a church built in the late 1400s. Old, beautiful in some ways, but not particularly welcoming. And we're sitting there, and the, the uh, guide is telling us all about Martin Luther's baptism and why he was <laughs> baptized Martin and all of that. And I'm listening, but I'm also distracted. I'll admit it. I'm distracted because over along the side, this is in the sanctuary, over along the side are five architectural renderings and models. And I'm thinking to myself, what is that all about in this place that was built in the late 1400s? No history there. No history.
industry there. People don't have any investment in that. Uh, and so afterwards, I raised my hand and I said, I'm wondering, do you know what that's all about? And she says, oh, she said, I'd be happy to tell you. This church, I suppose in the face of, you know, complete, um, disappearing completely, is focusing on revival. And part of their revival is to do some building renovation that will make their space more usable for ministry. Hmm. Hmm. I thought, can you say more? <laughs> well, what she told me was that there are three actual church sites. There's one Lutheran parish, but they have three church sites. One is St. Peter, St. Paul, which is where Luther was baptized. One is St. Andrews, which is where Luther last preached and died. And then there's a third church that they have to maintain. They can't let it fall to, re to ruin. The government requires that, but they're not using that building. So less than 100 people attending worship have these two huge buildings. And they've decided they're going to make one center for baptism, and they're going to make the other... There's another focus for the other one. Why? Well, because the time when people come to church most, more than anything else, is at these pivotal points in their lives. When, in their minds, they're coming to pay for a particular service that they have, or to participate in a particular service that they have a right to. So they're going to take advantage of that. They're going to make this church a center for baptism. And when people come and ask for their child to be <coughs> baptized. It's not going to be just a matter of stand up and pour water on their head. It's going to be a whole program of discipleship. Teaching discipleship, teaching the significance of baptism, having the architectural space reflect that. So what does that mean in a church that was built in the late 1400s? It means the whole chancel area which includes the altar, all of the seating area is being completely redone. This is not a minor change. This is a major renovation for the sake of ministry. And I have to tell you, I sat there and I looked at those different drawings. They've already picked one. And I listened to what she had to say. And I thought, Thanks be to God. There's going to be at least one church in Germany that isn't a museum where people come to fondly remember the past. There's going to be at least one church in Germany that's striving to do ministry, to bring the Reformation faith into the 21st century. Now there's parallels to our church. I won't beat them to death right now. But I will say this. I will say that if our focus is on receiving and sharing the love of God, on growing abundantly in faith, on sharing the mercy and grace of God, so that it has a transforming impact, not just on us who gather here, but on that 50% who have no affiliation whatsoever with any religious community. If that's all our focus, then our focus will be on ministry above all else. And we'll do whatever it takes to make ministry happen. And we won't become a museum. Because that's where mainline churches are headed. Frankly. We won't become a museum. We'll become a place where the good news of God's grace in Jesus is boldly proclaimed. And guess what? We'll be even more Lutheran than we've ever been before. Amen.